All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Gaurav Gupta. I am a VP of Engineering for Cloud and Infrastructure for a company called Snapdeal. And uh, in this presentation, uh, I want to talk about the journey that Snapdeal took uh, from moving from a public cloud to a hybrid cloud based on OpenStack. So um, what are we going to do in the next 45 minutes? Um, I'm going to try to give you a brief introduction about who we are, what do we do, to get you an idea on uh, why did we need uh, to build our own OpenStack cloud. And, uh, oops, um, and why did we do that? Um, also some technical overview of our uh, Snapdeal cloud. Um, we'll share some key learnings, some insight uh, details about the cloud. And uh, if time permits, we'll go through a brief demo of our uh, infrastructure as a code capabilities. All right, so <clears throat> um, Snapdeal, uh, we are an e-commerce company. We have one of the largest um, e-commerce marketplace in India. Um, we have uh, uh, more than 50 million uh, products in our catalog. Uh, we are in a hyper growth mode for the last few years uh, with a million daily transacting users coming on our site and buying products. Uh, we are a marketplace, so we also have a seller base of, of more than 300,000 sellers who come to our platform to offer their products to, to the customer base we have. And uh, in the last few years, like I said, we've seen phenomenal growth of, on our business, on the amount of transactions we are doing on our platform. Um, and uh, we are just getting started. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, India right now has about 370 million people who are connected online out of which uh, about 50 to 70 million people are doing transactions. So there is a huge population of uh, people who are yet to come and make transactions online, which is all the traffic that we will receive. If you extrapolate that for a few years, the projections are that we are going to cross uh, more than 500 million internet users um, who will be transacting. Um, most of them will come from mobile, and, uh, and that's what we are also seeing in our platform. More than 70% of transactions that happens on our site are coming from uh, mobile devices. Uh, so what did, what did we do uh, with regards to OpenStack? Uh, we built <coughs> our own cloud. We call it Cirrus. And uh, Cirrus is a, a, a private cloud based on OpenStack. We have uh, more than 16 petabytes of uh, storage that we have built for our infrastructure. Uh, we are running in three different regions uh, with the capacity of uh, more than 100,000 cores. Um, we are, uh, our networking uh, is 40 gig, 40 gig from uh, servers going to the spine node and 100 gig on top of it, so very fast network. And uh, we are doing all of that with 100% automation and deploying everything using Ansible and uh, uh, automation scripts that we have written our, on our own. We did all of this in the last one year, and when we came out uh, a few months ago when we launched our, our cloud, um, we got to know that we are in the top 4% of global OpenStack deployments in the world, uh, which is both a proud moment as well as uh, uh, very nervous to see that we, have, we are running such a large OpenStack cloud. But happy to be here, happy to connect with the community, and uh, we, we'd, we would like to get more engaged. So far, we've been working in a silo, uh, primarily because there was a large amount of work that we had to do in a very short amount of time. And we are really ha very happy with our OpenStack deployments and like to show some more uh, details on that. Uh, we are running in a very high core density racks, uh, more than 3,500 cores per rack in a, in a, in a completely redundant pod-based uh, architecture. So. Um, why did we build a private cloud? Um, so uh, cost was one of the major factor. Like I was explaining before, uh, we are a very large hyper growth company. And as we saw our business grow, our infrastructure requirements also continue to grow. And our bills on the public cloud side uh, were phenomenal. And we, it, it had to uh, uh, sort of, we had to find ways to reduce that bill or control that one. And uh, uh, doing it in the public cloud was, was very challenging. And uh, when we did the analysis, it was very clear to us that at a certain uh, uh, growth, at a certain scale, um, public clouds stop being cost effective. 
they are okay if your growth is unpredictable when you're starting up i think one should go to the public cloud and get their business established but once you hit an inflection point you need to start looking at uh, some alternative and for us it was building our own private cloud um, when you do that the economies of scale also kick in and then you start getting the benefits of cost so cost was was definitely one of the key reason for us to start looking at the problem uh, but how did we make it cost effective? Uh, firstly, um, our entire stack it was, is built on open source technologies. We did evaluate some enterprise uh, technologies like VMware and also um, OpenStack, uh, commercial offerings, uh, distributions. And we, uh, when we evaluated the cost of the scale at which we were running, it was very clear that we had to build it ourselves. We had to build it using open source uh, components. We also did that. Uh, we also took into account the operational cost of, of creating a cloud. So we did this with a very small team of um, engineers who have uh, spent a lot of time in past building enterprise products so that they can understand and embrace what OpenStack uh, you know, offers and not just use it, but also uh, sort of understand it and embrace it. So it is very important for us it was very important for us to make sure that the team is uh, appropriate for uh, maintaining, for building this particular cloud platform. And we also converted a lot of our uh, CapEx into OpEx. Uh, for example, we, uh, uh, for all the hardware equipment that we are buying, we are, uh, you know, uh, if you have taken it on, a cap, on an OpEx model, we have negotiated uh, power consumption with the co-location provider so that it's all bundled in, in uh, into the operational cost of the of the data center and we and by doing this we are able to do apples to apples comparison of what is the cost of running a private cloud versus what was the cost of running uh, of us running in a public cloud and clearly there were cost savings uh, the next uh, big reason for us to to do this uh, besides cost was performance and security uh, we wanted to get more performance from our infrastructure and in a public cloud you are restricted because again you're in a shared tenant environment and there's only so much uh, performance that uh, public clouds offer they can offer you a lot more but with a very high cost but it is restrictive for the large scale that we were looking for so so by building our own private cloud we were able to now optimize for self-use we are able to put advanced security uh, uh, appliances, uh, DDoS prevention, intrusion detection into our data center. Um, so definitely a, a step up into the security that public cloud offers. And uh, uh, lastly, data sovereignty and compliance was also a big uh, reason for us. Um, so Snapdeal is an ecosystem. We also have a digital wallet, which required us to uh, make sure that all the data that, uh, that we store, uh, the, the money that we store in the digital wallet remains within the uh, boundaries of India. And at that time, the public cloud provider that we were using did not have a region in India. Hence, we had to look for, at least for that particular application, to be hosted within the boundaries. So that was also one of the reasons for us to start thinking of building our own um, private cloud. <clears throat> so to summarize, these were the four reasons for, uh, because of which we, we built it. Cost, performance, security, and data sovereignty. But we didn't stop there. Um, our uh, private clouds, uh, cloud is 100% hybrid. Um, what that really means for us is we have set a definition, and I'll, I'll read it verbatim, and then we'll go over that. A true hybrid cloud expands seamlessly to public cloud and abstracts the underlying infrastructure away from the applications. So they can be dynamically assigned and reassigned to run in different parts of the cloud. If um, some of you might have seen the presentation in the keynote today, where um, uh, there was a presentation of launching a workload in OpenStack and AWS uh, at the same time. I think what we are trying to do is that on steroids. Um, we practically have uh, a hybrid cloud, which is extended from a public cloud all the way to our data center. And our applications are launched in a seamless fashion in, on OpenStack-based cloud or this public cloud provider. And the application does not know where they're running. So we have completely abstracted the, uh, the, the infrastructure layer uh, from our application layer. And because of these reasons, we are using OpenStack purely as an IaaS provider to us. 
we are not using a lot of PaaS um, projects that uh, are in OpenStack because of the limitation that they work. They're, they're catered for the OpenStack uh, based clouds, but not for public clouds. We are, we've written our own PaaS layers on top of uh, OpenStack to, to be able to do both of these things for us transparently. Uh, so why did we do hybrid cloud? Um, one of the main reason is bursting. Uh, we are an e-commerce company and we have seasonal traffic. Um, just like in the United States you have Thanksgiving. In India you have uh, Diwali, which is this uh, festive season. It's going on right now. Uh, a lot of traffic comes to our site during that, uh, during that time and we wanted to make sure that we have the capability to burst out in a public cloud if we ever run out of infrastructure in our private cloud. Um, the second big use case for us was disaster recovery. So given that we are now uh, 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 going to be running in a private cloud, we needed another uh, similar data center simi or an extended region so that we can create a disaster recovery zone. That would require twice the capex, twice the opex for building the, the particular cloud. But instead, we decided to use a public cloud as a disaster recovery zone. Now, everything that we do, all the data, all the applications, are seamlessly copied in a public cloud all the time. And if a disaster happens and our primary data center goes down, we will be able to move 100% into the public cloud. All right, so let's jump into some of the technical details. Um, so Snapdeal was born in the cloud. We are about six years old, and we pretty much use all the popular open source projects under the sun. This is not even an exhaustive list. It's something I just put together this morning to just give you an idea that uh, building a cloud for us was more than just building the infrastructure. It was about how do we migrate and run all of these um, applications in our cloud. Um, and we already are running them in the public cloud. Now we had to first migrate it and then seamlessly run it at that performance. Um, we are also microservices based. So we had 500 plus services running in our infrastructure, talking to each other. And we had to first understand their architecture. We had to understand their dependencies on each other. And then create a mechanism by which we can migrate these applications from public to private without, bring, without taking a downtime of our business. Um, that's, that was the you know, key requirement for us. So overall, this project for us was only half of it was infrastructure. The other half was making sure the applications are, are handled properly. Um, so if I look at uh, just our architecture of, uh, of a single node, of, uh, of a single server, uh, this is how it looks like. So we are using Ubuntu as our host operating system. Um, we, we, chose, we evaluated Ubuntu, CentOS, SUSE, and we chose Canonical Ubuntu because of um, its uh, uh, deep integration with OpenStack, a lot of uh, large deployments like ours were using, open, uh, were using Ubuntu. And uh, um, so, so those were some of the reasons from the kernel version and everything was, uh, was more tested with the OpenStack uh, versions. And then we combined it with OpenStack. We are using uh, Kilo 4. So we are still on a, on a very uh, old release you know, relative to what we have. We just launched Neutron uh, uh, just now. But the reason for us to do that was because we, uh, stability mattered more than features for us. And for the reference uh, architectures that we did, for the amount of testing that we did in Kilo, we found Kilo to, to, to satisfy our requirements. And for, again, the size of architecture that we had, we wanted to stick with uh, stability. Um, again, we're using KVM and Kumu as our uh, hyperver uh, hypervisor. And all of this is getting automatically um, deployed using Ansible. So this is the box of our infrastructure. Um, we have the capability today to launch, uh, to, to add hundreds of nodes, physical servers, into our infrastructure in a single day. We are able to create a single pod, a single rack, uh, completely automated, and add it to our infrastructure cloud within hours. And we do that all the time. 
On top of it, if you look at, um, we are using CentOS as the operating system for our virtual machines. Given that we are a private cloud, we control the environment and we have standardized all our applications to run on CentOS. Um, on top of CentOS, the first thing that we do is we, we, we do service discovery of our applications. So we are using a, a project, open source project called SmartStack, which gives us the ability to do service discovery as well as load balancing. Um, so in the web world, we are, most of our applications are multi-tiered and they, are, they have a you know, layer of web servers talking to some sort of a database, uh, MySQL, Mongo, Cassandra, whatnot. And then they offer services which are accessed by other services over RESTful API. So this creates a very uh, dense uh, graph of service dependencies. Um, in a public cloud, you would typically have a layer four or layer seven load balancer running as a, as a central uh, load balancing service. And when some uh, service A wants to talk to service B, it talks to that load balancer and the load balancer distributes the traffic. In our architecture, we have made it completely distributed. So we're running a small HA proxy on every web server that we are launching. And um, the application running on that server talks to the local HA proxy whenever it wants to reach out. Now this creates a very distributed uh, load balancing uh, architecture. But again, it has the challenges of that now with thousands of nodes, you have to program all of the attributes and all of the endpoints on that particular, um, on each of the HA proxy node. So we're using Zookeeper for propagating that and SmartStack as the, as the architecture which is, which is um, programming this. Um, we're using another open source uh, project called Terraform. Um, this is similar to, if, if you guys are familiar with Heat, this is similar to that. This is the orchestration tool which is talking to OpenStack and talking to the public cloud for launching the infrastructure. This is, uh, uh, it, it has integrations with uh, uh, public clouds like AWS, Azure, so that from a single pane of glass, for us, there is no UI, we are still using CLI, but we are able to now orchestrate different cloud, uh, di uh, uh, virtual machines in different clouds seamlessly. Um, our application stack is managed by Salt, and we have written our own custom scripts and uh, automation software in Python. So, so this particular block, the top block, is the application stack for us uh, by which we control it. Now, this does not contain the application itself, uh, which is going to be on top of it. We have, uh, from the infrastructure side, we have made uh, the OpenStack control plane completely redundant. We are running, um, this diagram shows three, but in production, we are running five uh, independent controllers of OpenStack. Uh, we have made sure that we, our control plane and data plane are completely separate. We do testing like we shut down our complete control plane and then check if our OpenStack cloud continues to stay up. Because uh, a control plane dying should not have any impact on our, our, our data layer, which is where all our applications are running. Now, that was very critical for us, so we designed it for that. Um, so this diagram shows you that how a VIP is transferred from a primary node to a secondary node. Uh, this happens transparently. Um, and then all the services are running everywhere. And then most of, most of them, like uh, RabbitMQ and everything, are running in, in almost all the controller nodes. Um, we have designed a, a highly scalable storage layer as well. And uh, when we were sort of working on our storage uh, design, it was... Uh, uh, evident that we had to build multiple uh, kinds of storage because one storage was not going to solve our, uh, uh, all the needs that we had. So the biggest storage that we have is based on Ceph. Uh, we have two separate kinds of Ceph storage. Uh, one is using um, uh, magnetic disks. This is the largest Ceph, Ceph storage we have. And this is primarily used for uh, booting the virtual machines. So all our root volumes come from our magnetic uh, storage of Ceph, and we use them for things like logs, which are, again, low, low performance, but you, know, requ you require a lot of disk for that. This lowers the cost of, of running this Ceph cluster. But if any application requires high performance and high redundancy storage, then we also have an SSD Ceph cluster. And yesterday, you know, there were several talks um, uh, from, I mean, Walmart was talking about that, that they have a very similar architecture of a S S SSD Ceph 
uh, for you know high performance uh, applications and high, uh, storage for high performance applications uh, and we have a very similar architecture this so this is about uh, 10 petabytes of, of storage just coming out from Ceph. Um, but we also had a requirement of many applications uh, who needed local SSD. Um, for example, there's a database called Aerospike, which is a low latency key value store. And it requires a raw disk to be given to the, to the database application. And there were several others like that uh, in our uh, environment. So what we've created is a host aggregate where uh, virtual machines are able to get a local SSD as well. If you look at the cost of these two things, the SSD storage is going to be the most expensive storage. So we, given the size, we had to balance between the two. And uh, for SSD Ceph, we have used a replication factor of two. For magnetic Ceph, we have used a replication factor of three. Uh, for SSD storage, which is local, uh, we are not we are saying that the redundancy of the data has to be uh, with the application itself. The infrastructure is not going to provide redundancy in case the disk fails. So we've kept the three different kinds of SLA and given it to the applications. Now most of the applications which are using local SSD are already in a cluster and clustered environment. Uh, for example, Aerospike has uh, its own uh, replication mechanism by which it replicates the data into multiple nodes, and it can tolerate um, a node failure very easily. But what is very important when you're doing clustered applications, which is pretty much all the applications that we have, um, is that you have to be very careful of VM placement. If in a cluster you ever place two virtual machines on the same host, then if, when, when a single node will fail, two virtual machines will die, and most likely you will have data loss. So what we have extended on top of OpenStack is the capability that when you are launching a cluster, you're defining anti-affinity rules over there. And our, our anti-affinity rules goes like this. Um, first is that there's an anti-affinity of a pod, then there is an anti-affinity of a rack, and then there is an anti-affinity of a server. So if I'm launching, say, a six-node cluster of anything, uh, let's say MySQL, then first the rule will apply that I'm going to place six virtual machines across six different pods. And the definition of a pod, and I'll come to that in the next slide, is basically a combination of three racks. So if, if I can find six different pods, I'm going to play, place these six virtual machines across these pods. So the chances of an entire pod failing is relatively low. But say if I am launching a cluster of, I don't know, 50, 100 nodes, then it, I may run out of pods. I may not have these many pods available, but I at least make sure that I have redundancy across racks, and you can extend this logic to say, uh, if I can't get that, then at least I will have redundancy across servers, and if that is also not available, then I will fail that operation. I'm not going to go and, and create a cluster for you because that is extremely dangerous. So we've, we've used this kind of techniques to make sure that we are able to recover from, from a single node failure. Um, moving forward, we also have a very large data lake for our big data platform. We are using HDFS for that, and that is uh, uh, built on using, again, um, spinning drives. This is petabytes of storage available for our big data platform. As an e-commerce company, we do a lot of uh, analytics on the data that we collect. Every click, every scroll, every view is data for us, and we crunch that. So we are generating you know, terabytes of data uh, daily for, uh, for our uh, big data platform. And that goes in the Hadoop platform. And lastly, we, we do have a, a little bit of enterprise storage as well. Uh, this is, um, we, although we would like to avoid it, but there are some use cases for which enterprise storage works very well. For example, we are, we are using enterprise storage for keeping backups of our data. Data is, is extremely important for us. And we sort of give in at that point in time and at least store a copy of our, uh, of our, our data into enterprise storage and few more use cases like that. But the use is very, very minimal. One uh, very important thing that I want to point out that uh, I've also um, um, sort of spoken with, with a couple of other companies who've built OpenStack is that we're using Ceph storage uh, for our root volumes. So 100% of our OpenStack cluster now boot from volume. That creates a big failure domain and dependency on, on Ceph itself. Um, but we, so far in our uh, experiments and in, in our experience, it works reasonably well. And um, it gives us the flexibility to now do live migration and things like that. OK. 
Okay. All right. So for networking, we're using CLOS uh, network architecture. Basically, it's a spine leaf architecture. We have uh, spine switches, which are uh, 100G, and they're going to uh, top of the rack switches for each of the um, rack that we have, and which are go uh, going to the, each of the server with a 40G uh, uh, connectivity. This gives us the redundancy that I was talking about, and it also gives a very highly performant network all the way from a server to, to any other server in the, in the network. Um, this gives us the ability to now use all the storage in the network. We don't require a lot of directly attached storage at all. Um, this also gives us uh, you know, redundancy on, on, at any point in time. Uh, even on the top uh, north-south traffic, we have pairs of uh, you know, high and load balancers because of the traffic that comes in to our data center. And then again, all firewalls, all routers, everything is in a redundant architecture. Uh, the three rack that you see per pod is what I was talking about in the previous one. So I just want to quickly show you um, a high level of high level view of what an application migration looks like for us. This is a very simplistic view, but if you look at on the left hand side, let's say this is a public cloud uh, view of a single single application. It has a L7 load balancer on top and bunch of app servers at which it is load balancing. And these app servers are doing, uh, um, are accessing data from, let's say, a MySQL cluster. A uh, bunch of reads uh, servers and a single write server. So the first thing that we do is we create a replica uh, database on our uh, private cloud, and then we set up replication between them. So this gives the ability now that the data is completely backed up from a public cloud onto uh, our own infrastructure. The next thing that we do is using Terraform, as I was talking about, which is our orchestration layer. We launch a replica of the same application into our own um, cloud. Now, at this point in time, there are two copies of the same application running. But uh, the data is still being accessed by the primary, which is in the public cloud. We just have a replica with the exact data completely in replication sync. Now, to make that happen, we had to make sure that the process of launching an application is 100% automated, because this could not have been done uh, manually. And this is what I will show you in the demo. Um, so from the point that um, a developer is checks in the code to the point that it gets deployed on a server, the entire pipeline is automated for us. Next we do is we open up this application for read only, so that we can do basic verification check. You can run. Uh, simple checks to make sure that the connectivity is there and then data is consistent. Once the verification step is done, we point the DNS from the primary application to the new application which is running in our cloud now. And then we blow away the, the primary copy. Now at this point in time, the application is pretty much migrated into our infrastructure. After that, we can delete or blow away all the older databases and then launch a new database, or reuse one of the older ones, as the read copy. This goes back to the disaster recovery use case that I was talking about. That For all the databases that are running in, in our private cloud, there is a copy of the database in the public cloud as well for disaster recovery purpose. So what, what were some of the key learnings from the entire journey that we had for the last one year to migrate from a public cloud to a private cloud? So first thing is, you know, for OpenStack, uh, own it, don't just operate it. Um, we practically have uh, knowledge of uh, the OpenStack code, so that if a problem strikes, we are able to go and debug it, fix it, patch it ourselves. Uh, this is very, very important for us, because if it happens at, say, 2 in the night, there is no way for us to reach out to anybody else and come to, uh, to come and help us to fix it. Our entire business depends on it. And that's the key learning for anybody who is trying to use OpenStack for production environments, that you have to really own it. It's your code. It's your software. You can't point fingers at anyone. So you need to learn how to, uh, how to fix it as well. Um, keep it simple. Um, that's what we did, at least. We are not jumping into any of the advanced features, advanced projects of OpenStack yet. We, we, we might do that over time. Many of those things, we wrote it ourselves. Uh, but our, our uh, 
mantra from day one was we will deploy something that we understand. Um, design the control plane to be highly redundant. We talked about that. And automate upgrades and test frequently. And we do that a lot. Our entire OpenStack build is actually, uh, we, we patch it, we do bug fixes on it, and we regularly put it in production. And in an automatic fashion without taking any downtime of the infrastructure. So um, it's highly recommended that you, you test the part of upgrades because that's going to bite you in the ass when, when it comes to upgrading to, a, let's say, a major version or to do a bug fix in production. We've also built a capability to build OpenStack on OpenStack or to, or to launch OpenStack on OpenStack, which basically means that for any time that we want to do a bug fix testing, we are able to launch a brand new OpenStack environment on our uh, cloud itself. So that gives us a lot of ability to do continuous integration and, and testing. Uh, yeah, this is something that uh, was an uh, eye-opener for us. Uh, understand your applications very well, uh, you'll be surprised what's underneath. And we found that a lot. Uh, uh, we thought that we knew our applications, we thought they behaved a certain way, but once we did the migration, they didn't work uh, uh, in the first attempt. And there were all sorts of things going on, especially around the dependency uh, graph. There was applications which were bypassing the, the API layer and talking directly to databases. They would break. Um, there were uh, cron jobs running uh, which were not part of CI CD. They would break once you do the migration. So there were a lot of learning process for us. And one thing that we did as part of this migration is we didn't migrate as is. We fixed our application on the, uh, which was running on the public cloud, and then we migrated it. So we then sort of inherited the mess. We cleaned up the mess, and then we migrated it. Then again, automate and monitor everything. I mean, that was the key for us. We were talking about you know, thousands, of uh, thousands of servers and you know, hundreds of applications. We couldn't, we couldn't possibly migrate it unless we knew what was going on and how, how they were behaving. So building automation and, and monitoring on top of it was, was extremely critical for us. All right, so, um, so with this, I'll just uh, give you a quick demo um, and just sort of walk you through some of the processes of how uh, we launch applications in, in our own cloud. I'm just going to do a quick time check. So in this demo, um, what, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to launch a brand new application called Hermes, um, completely from a CLI and, and, and using infrastructure as code. So first thing what we do is we create this thing called you know, uh, a new, new service on our application, which is basically, which creates a, a, a YAML file for us, which describes what are the different properties of this ap application. So right now we are just saying that it's called, um, it's called Hermes. We've given some email addresses of who's the owner of this application and what, which group owns the application. And this is the list of our platform um, which are basically deployed automatically using the code that we've written. Um, so you, you are seeing Aerospike, Cassandra, Elasticsearch. So in this particular case, let's say it's a simple Tomcat service, and we will select that particular service and, and launch it. So over here, uh, what we are specifying is what's the repository from which the code for this particular application will come through. Specifying the port, 8080. And once we see the, the YAML file that is being produced by that particular script, this is what it looks like. And this is a very simple, uh, simplistic view of, the, of an application. But you can see the basic things. I mean, it has uh, things like what's the name of this component, which is Hermes. Uh, what type is it? It's an Nginx service. Where is the repository for this ap uh, application in GitHub? And what ports does it run on? The load balancer port is what I was talking about in SmartStack when we are running a local HA proxy. That's for that. And it also uh, specifies what are the minimum number of instances, what's the max number of instances that you need. Now, um, and of course, the CPU and memory uh, configuration. 
Now this information, the CPU and memory information, is interpreted by our code. When we are launching a virtual machine, it's going to launch a virtual machine of this particular size. It is also going to keep track of how many instances of this virtual machine of, of, of uh, these VMs are running. And it will always make sure that it runs uh, the count that you have specified here as the minimum number of instances. So if you specify that you want a minimum of 10 instances, it's going to track that at any point in time you have at least 10 instances running. And if one dies for some other reason, some reason or the other, it's going to launch it automatically. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to fast forward some of this. So once you check in this particular file, by the way, um, so in this demo, what we did was we created uh, an application and a MySQL also. So we've combined them together that there is a dependency between the two. And we push this file into our infrastructure repository, which creates uh, a and uh, a merge request in, in GitHub, uh, in GitLab, and we will have to accept this, this particular uh, request, which, will, which is going to run a bunch of automated tests for us. I'm going to skip this part. So this is just showing that in Jenkins, it's going to accept it, and it's going to go through the pipeline of uh, running all the CI, CD tests, and then accepting this particular merge request, and then giving it uh, to uh, the, the orchestration code that we had to go and talk to OpenStack or the public cloud to run this particular thing. It, in the checks, we do things like there is uh, no conflict of ports, um, whatever you're specifying in terms of uh, the size of the virtual machine, the dependency, the application, they all uh, exist. At, in the end, it's going to create uh, a new tenant in our OpenStack cloud. And given that we are a private cloud, we could, have potentially, we could potentially run everything in a single tenant environment. But what we have done is, for each component that we have, it runs in, it runs in its own tenant network. And it's completely sort of restricted from, from uh, access from uh, any other tenant. This was done for security reasons, and it was also to make sure that we understand what our applications are, are doing. So if an application requires to talk to somebody else, it has to be specified in the same YAML file that I was talking about to say, I want to talk to service B on port XYZ, and then the, the, spe the specific uh, security group would be open. So in this particular example, since we were launching, launching a new component, a new tenant environment was launched in OpenStack, and um, virtual machines were created inside it. And then all of this was done using the scripts. So this is showing that now there is a project called Hermes. And we can go inside that. And we can see that there are two virtual machines that got created. One is a MySQL service, uh, server, and other is a, is a Tomcat or an Nginx. And we can access uh, this particular Tomcat to see if there's any application running on it, which is basically simply showing you that it, it is an application that is connected to the database it has launched. Now, this entire thing was, could have been done in the public cloud as well. You, can have, you could have specified any number of instances. It would have launched that for you. So that concludes the presentation. Um, uh, but we can do uh, questions after that. Thank you. Yes. 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 No. I, I, and we we actually understand that challenge. Uh, so a lot. So what we do is uh, we we keep ourselves at least on the uh, in in our example the kilo train. So we do pull all the changes that are happening in kilo, and any change that we make on top of it, we have uh, it's it's a separate code base. We understand what change we are making and what change what code we are picking up from the community. Now we are we we actually had that problem when we moved from kilo two to kilo four. 
it was a large change for us. It was, a, it was a sort of a hairy merge for us to make sure that any code fix that we are doing and whatever we are picking up on the community. But at, this, at that point in time, we didn't have an option because we didn't want to move to Liberty. Um, we made this cloud in, in a matter of about one year, which, which meant that there were so many intermediate steps that we did. For example, we launched our dev and test uh, cloud environment first, which went into production uh, earlier around January, February timeframe. Now, we, there was, uh, what we did not want to do is we didn't want to launch our production environment on an open stock, open stack software that we had not tested. So there were reasons for us to do that because we trusted the code that we were running. We understood the code. And it's going to have challenges when we will move uh, a major version like Liberty. But at that point in time, what we will do is we'll create a parallel environment. We will probably uh, install Liberty or one of the uh, you know, more stable versions of OpenStack and then migrate our workloads on top of it rather than doing this. So it's, it's a thing that we understand, but given that what we were doing at that point in time, we, we found it more appropriate to, do, uh, to own it rather than you know, keep on with the latest code. Uh, yes, I think you asked first. Uh, S on top of SSD Ceph? Yes. So um, many applications are running uh, on top of SSD Ceph. Databases uh, are actually, uh, when you say databases, MySQL is actually not one of them. MySQL is using a local uh, data copy, uh, a local disk, because some of our databases require very high throughput, and a local SSD is going to give you that kind of performance. But many others, like Mongo and Cassandra, for example, they are using uh, Ceph SSD. There are, there are other examples of databases and also message queues like Kafka that are using um, uh, Ceph-based SSD storage. Yes. How many people you have in your team working on um, I have a relatively small team. Uh, my total cloud platform team is about 25 people. That includes the data center folks as well who, who go and, and do racking and stacking and, and, and maintaining the physical infrastructure. Uh, yes, and then I'll come to you. What's the sweet spot for you if uh, uh, an application should run in a public or in a private environment? Um, I, I don't see, based on the experience that we've had, that there is a, um, there is a certain application that, ha that needs to run in a certain kind of a public or a private cloud environment. Um, but if I were to think about it right now, I would say that some of the enterprise uh, softwares like ERPs and you know Oracle and things like that they're better suited in a, in a private environment than in a public environment but that's also changing for us what was more important is that our applications are able to run on either of the platform and and that's what we try to achieve yes Yes, I can, I can share that uh, a little bit. So like I was telling you, we did migration in a few phases. First, we migrated our dev and test environment, which was also fairly large and growing. Uh, our uh, ROI for our dev and test data center was only eight months. So within, in eight months, we were able to recoup all the investment that went in. And from that point on, it was a very small incremental operational cost. For the large production data center that we have built, our calculations of ROI are 1.6 years, so which is again ex extremely, extremely, uh, you know, cost beneficial. Um, I'll, yeah, this question here. Yeah. Okay, when your control plane is completely isolated, and you said the resources to shut off the control plane, and the, uh, then how the VM should reach it? Since you are using it. Uh, so. Uh, so the question is that if you if you shut down the control plane, how will the north south traffic happen? So our, our, uh, we are using a provider network. So our north south traffic, which which happens, or it goes through a separate network itself, and our control plane network is completely isolated. So even if that shuts down or there is an issue there, our data platform, our data plane traffic continues to work. Yes. Uh, somebody had a question. Yes.
So why, did, why do we do the migration? Uh, because, uh, like I said, we were 100% running in a public cloud. We created a private cloud, and we had to migrate our applications to it. We could not shut down our usage of, of public cloud and create brand new infrastructure because our business runs here. So the entire thing had to be migrated, and that migration also had to happen transparently. That means when you know, traffic comes to our site, they don't know uh, where, we're coming, uh, where they're going to. But I think that's the time, uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you, everybody. All right.